you know, we all see things catch on. Uh, they might be products uh, at the grocery store uh, or online. They might be content. Uh, videos go viral on the web. They may be ideas uh, like social movements that percolate across the country and around the world. Uh, but the question I'm going to ask today is, well, why do some of these things catch on and others don't? Uh, and how by understanding why things catch on, can we help our own ideas, uh, whether they be products, services, initiatives, nonprofits, uh, become more more successful? Uh, but to help us get there, I'm going to start in a very different place. I want to play a quick game uh, called Which is Tastier. I promise you've probably not played this game before, but I guarantee you'll get the hang of it quite quickly. Uh, I'm going to put up two things on the screen, and I'm going to ask you which of these things is tastier. Uh, and importantly, I want you to be honest. Not what you wish was tastier, not which thing you think should be tastier, but which of the two things on the screen in front of you is actually tastier. I promise uh, that'll be quite, uh, quite easy. So our first contestant is a wonderful, delicious head of broccoli. Now, you're probably aware that broccoli has a lot of vitamins and nutrients. You're probably aware that broccoli has a lot of fiber. You may not have realized that broccoli has a lot of vitamin C, uh, but it actually does. Uh, so the next time that you have a cold and you think you need a tall glass of orange juice, think about a tall stalk uh, broccoli instead. Uh, but that's our contest number one. And our contest number two is a cheeseburger. Now, this is not my version of a cheeseburger. Uh, if I was going to eat a cheeseburger, I would probably put uh, bacon on top. Uh, I might switch out the American cheese for blue cheese. I might grill the onions. I might keep the pickles because I do love pickles. Uh, feel free to put whatever toppings you like on the cheeseburger. And to keep things even, to be fair, feel free to put whatever toppings you like on the broccoli as well. Okay, so here's the time we're going to take a quick vote. Which is tastier? And I, I won't ask for a show of hands since we're all virtual, but it, would you say the cheeseburger or would you say the broccoli? Right now, I can't read your minds, but I'm guessing most of you said the cheeseburger. You'd say, well, the cheeseburger's obviously tastier, right? I mean, I know that I should eat more fruits and vegetables, but the cheeseburger's just tastier, right? And it's not random or luck how it works. The cheeseburger, the way it's designed, fits better with our tongue and our stomach, right? Uh, fast food like cheeseburgers, the delicious cheese, the fat, the salt, all of it makes our tongue just light up. Right? Uh, the company McDonald's has spent millions of dollars engineering French fries so that have crisp and salt and sugar. They do exactly what they're designed to do. Certain food uh, is, is tastier than, than others. Right? The broccoli, we wish it was tastier. We know we should eat more broccoli, but, but we don't. Um, and so one question we could ask is, well, hey, how does something that's more like the broccoli become more successful? right? We know we should do it. Organizations spent decades of time, if not millions or billions of dollars, to try to get us to eat more fruits and vegetables, and yet we don't do it, right? And so how by understanding why things like this, a cheeseburger, are tastier, can we understand how to engineer good stuff to be more successful, right? Taking this analogy outside of food, though I know we all love food, to the way we communicate, certain ideas are just tastier based on the way they fit not tongues or stomachs, but with minds, right? Certain ideas end up being successful because they fit with the way our minds are designed. And if we understand how our minds are designed and how certain ideas are more successful, we can design our own stuff to be more effective. Let me give you just a couple more examples of what I need. So a couple of years ago, NASA, uh, right, uh, put out uh, a few messages. Uh, this was NASA's message. They said, hey, cuts to NASA's budget and delays or to key programs, along with our reliance on Russian manned space vehicles, threaten our leadership in space. This is a message that NASA put out uh, a few years ago. But there was a message that circulated among the population more broadly. Uh, we've been to the moon. What else do we need? Right Now, these are two different messages. Both are true. Both are accurate. They're different perspectives. Right, um, uh, But I'm not asking at the moment which is true. I'm asking which is tastier. Which of these is more like the cheeseburger and which is more like the broccoli? Which of these messages is going to be easier to remember and share uh, and, and act on? Right, um, And how, by engineering messages to become more successful, can we get them to spread? I'll give you one more example, another important domain, um, cervical cancer screenings. Right, So um, the Association for Obstetrics and uh, Gynecologists put out a big announcement saying, hey, uh, you know, in women age 30 to 65, co-testing with cervical cytology, blah, 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 uh, you know, should be performed every three years. Annual screening uh, is not necessary, should not be performed. But there's a message out there that circulated saying get tested every year. Again, which of these is tastier? Not which is right, but which is tastier? Which fits better with the way our minds are designed? And how by understanding how our minds work, can we design those good, useful, true, valuable messages to be more successful? And so that's what I'm going to talk about today in the brief time we have together. First, how we can make our stuff tastier by understanding the science of word of mouth and social transmission. Second, how can we ensure the truth beats out falsehoods? 
right? We all know that we're living in a time of disinformation and misinformation. People often say things like, uh, you know, uh, lies have made uh, run a mile or two before the truth even gets uh, their boots on. One way to combat falsehoods is to design platforms to combat them. But another is to engineer true information to make it more likely to succeed. And so how can we help this stuff catch on? Well, one more question before I get there. If you had to guess, here are three products or brands that you may have heard of before. Disney, Cheerios, uh, and Scrubbing Bubbles. If you had to guess, which of these do you think gets the most word of mouth? Is it Disney? Is it Cheerios? Or is it Scrubbing Bubbles? Right? I've asked a number of people this question. I'll let you think about your answer. Most of the time, people say it's Disney World. Of course, who would talk about Cheerios or Scrubbing Bubbles? But that's actually wrong. Of these three products or brands, Cheerios gets the most word of mouth. And I think this points out something quite interesting. Word of mouth is a powerful driver of why things catch on. But if we don't understand what drives people to talk and drives them to share, it's going to be really hard to get them to talk about our stuff. So it goes without saying that word of mouth is quite uh, impactful. Uh, indeed, none of the McKinsey and company pointed out that word of mouth generates more than twice the sales of traditional advertising. Right? Uh, and it turns out there are two key reasons why word of mouth is more impactful. If you think about it, why is word of mouth more impactful than advertising? And by the way, I don't just mean traditional ads like radio spots or print campaigns or television ads. Anything that comes from an organization, whether that be paid or owned media rather than a peer, anything, even a nonprofit puts out a press release, for example, people are not as likely to listen to it uh, as if their friend or colleague says something. And there are two kind of reasons why. The first is trust. We don't trust ads. We don't trust things that come from companies and organizations. Why? Because they tend to be a little bit biased, right? If you think about uh, a shampoo ad, for example, it always shows someone getting long, flowy hair after they use the shampoo. If you think about a restaurant ad, it always shows families having a great time, right? Ads never say products and services aren't great. And the same holds for nonprofits, right? You've never seen information from a nonprofit saying our issue isn't important. No. Nonprofits always say our issue is extremely important. It's the most important issue. Pay attention to this issue. But the problem is that every nonprofit would say that. And so because of that, people don't actually know, well, how important is this issue? Of course, you, World Wildlife Fund, say wildlife is important. Of course, you, organization that declares about climate change, says it's the most pressing challenge of our time. But how do I know it's actually that important? And what's going to convince me to behave a particular way? But our friends and colleagues will tell it to us straight. They'll say, hey, I bought that product. I used that service. I worked with that organization. I spoke to this nonprofit, right? They'll tell it to us straight. And because of that, we're much more likely to trust what they have to say. And so the first benefit is trust. But the second is a little more nuanced. And that's the targeting benefit. How do we find the right people that might be interested in our message? If we're a nonprofit, the right people that might want to donate. If we're a for-profit, the right people that might want to support our startup or buy our product or use our service. And it's difficult, right? Maybe we use targeted advertising online to try to find the most best people. But even then, we still don't know them as well as other people do. What if we could use their friends to do the work for us? And I'll give you an example of this. A couple of years ago, I got a free book in the mail. Academics often get free books. With, uh, from publishers, and they send them to us with the hopes that we'll assign them to our students and they'll sell more copies in the process. But this time I didn't get one book. I got two books. And it wasn't two different books. It was two copies of the exact same book. And I remember sitting there going, well, hey, what's with the second copy, right? What am I going to do with it? And there was a note in the back of it that said, hey, Professor Berger, we think you'll like this book, but we think you'll also know someone else who will like this book. Pass the second copy on to them. And that's the first very simple hack I'm going to share today. How by turning customers, audience members, whatever you want to call them, into advocates, can we get them to do the work for us? Because I didn't give that book out randomly. I passed it to the person in my office that I thought would find it most interesting and most relevant. No wonder then that referred business people that come in from word of mouth have 20% higher customer lifetime value than people that come in from ads or, or owned media. Because someone went through their social network to say this person would like it and this person wouldn't. Right? People tend to be friends with other people like them. Sociology is called homophily. Birds of a feather flock together, which means if you're the right target segment for something, you probably know a lot of other people that might be interested in that thing. No one's going to tell you about a great website for baby clothes if you don't have a baby. No one's going to tell you about a really great restaurant with spicy curries if they know you don't like spicy food. They pick and choose to share with you what they think you'll find interesting. And so because of that, if we can get people to talk and share, they'll do the work for us. They'll share our message and they'll help it catch on. And so the only question then is how do we do it? 
Well, usually when we think word of mouth, we think online. We think about Facebook, we think about Twitter, we think about LinkedIn, blogs, online reviews. If you had to guess from 100%, all of it, all the way down to zero, none of it, what percent of word of mouth would you guess is online? What percent of all word of mouth is online? You might say 50%, 60%, 70%, maybe even 80%. And unfortunately, you'd be wrong. It's not 70%, it's not 17%. It's around 7 to 10%. Only about 7 to 10% of all word of mouth is online. Does that mean that online isn't important? No. Online is certainly a great way to get people to share information, and it spreads faster uh, than it might ever spread offline. But only a small portion of all word of mouth is online. Most is offline, face-to-face, -face, right? Uh, talking to friends or colleagues or picking up the phone and calling someone. Most word of mouth is face-to-face. -face. And more importantly, by focusing so much on the technology, these online technologies, we forgot about something much more important, the psychology. Why are people talking and sharing in the first place? Because we can jump on these platforms and try to collect friends and followers and social connections. But if people don't, don't share our stuff, it's not going to matter. It's not about how many connections we have. It's not about how many quote unquote friends we have online. It's about do they share our stuff? Are they passing along, whether online or off, our messages? And good news, it's not random, it's not luck, and it's not chance. There's a science behind why people talk and why they share. We've looked at thousands of pieces of online content tens of thousands of brands, and millions of purchases around the United States and around the world. And again and again, we see the same factors, six factors come up. In Contagious, I put those six factors in a framework called the STEPS framework. That stands for social currency, triggers, emotion, public, practical value, and stories. Each of these is a psychological driver of why people talk, why people share, and leads all sorts of products, services, and ideas to catch on. Imagine someone tells you a secret. Not like a personal secret, but a secret. This brand is having a sale. Don't tell anybody else. Or, uh, oh my God, this new movie's going to come out. Don't tell anybody. Keep it, keep it to yourself. Right? The more someone tells you something that you think not everyone else knows, what's the first thing you do with that information? You share it. Why? Because having access to information that not everyone else knows makes you look smart and makes you look in the know. That's an example of social currency. Right? The, uh, the hamburger chain in and out has a secret menu. Uh, so most uh, in and outs are out in California, out West. But if you go on an in and out, usually four or five things on the menu. But you'll see some people ordering things that aren't on the menu. They say, I want a two by two or a four by four. Go, hold on. Those aren't on the menu, right? Well, they're on this secret menu. Now, the menu's not even that secret. It's available online. You can easily find it. But people love ordering off the secret menu and talking about it. Why? Because it makes them look good. Most posts on social media are positive. Look at me. Uh, I got a new car. Look at me, I met a celebrity. Look at me, this great thing happened to me. Nobody says, hey, look at me. I'm at the office working on Excel spreadsheet. Check out column C. Why? Because it wouldn't make them look very good. We pick and choose to share the things that make us look good and avoid sharing the ones that make us look bad. But the simple idea there is the better we can make people look, the more likely they'll be to talk about us. We think a lot about ourselves right? Our product, our service, our initiative, our idea, our thing. And we want to get people excited about it. And too often we talk, focus on ourselves, our thing, why it's so great. How can we make other people look good? Because the better we can make them look, just like in and out did with their secret menu, making you look special like in and out VIP, the more likely you'd be to tell someone else to get that social currency and bring the brand along for the ride. Let me give you one more example. Many of you may have seen a number of years ago, uh, Geico's ad for hump day. Insurance company Geico uh, had an ad for hump day. There's an annoying camel walking around an office going, what day is it? What day is it? What day is it? Everyone ignores him. He's a very annoying camel. Finally comes across this poor woman and she goes, it's hump day. And the camel goes, woo, woo. And the ad goes, how happy are people who save money with Geico? Happier than a camel on hump day. Get it? Camels, humps, hump day. Okay. It is funnier when you see it on television, but you, but you get the idea. Now, even though this is not that funny, this is the second most shared ad of a couple of years ago. Not a beer ad, not a car ad, but an insurance ad. If we had to think about categories we think people would talk about and share, we wouldn't have thought it would be insurance. Yet many people are sharing this. Why? Well, I'm a data guy. I dug a little deeper. This is what the share data looks like over time. Spike in shares, then it goes down. Then another spike, then it goes down. Then another spike, then it goes down. Look closer, spikes aren't random. They're seven days apart. And you'll even closer, you'll notice that they're every Wednesday, or as it's colloquially known, hump day. This piece of content is equally good or bad every day of the week. It's good about a Monday, 
go to bat on Tuesday, go to bat on Wednesday. But Wednesday rolls around, provides a ready reminder, what a psychologist would call a trigger to make people think about it and talk about it and share it. Because if something's top of mind, it's much more likely to be tip of tongue. Right? Too often we think word of mouth is just about things like social currency. Well, if people like it or it makes them look good, they'll talk about it. But what we forget is that if people don't think about something, they're never going to talk about it. Right? You may love something, but if you're not thinking about it, you're never going to talk about it. Think about this in a restaurant context. It may be a restaurant wherever you live that you love eating at. But if you never think about where, uh, when you're going out to dinner, you'll never go there. Right? 70% of purchase is consideration. Are you thinking about something in the first place? And so what we need to do is think about triggers that will remind people of us. Top of mind means tip of tongue, right? How can we make sure people are thinking about us? To give you an example of this, if I said peanut butter and, what word might come to mind? Probably say jelly. Or if I said milk and, well, you'd probably say cookies. Notice that peanut butter is almost like a little advertisement for jelly. It's almost like jelly should pay peanut butter like a kickback or a referral fee every time peanut butter is around. Because if peanut butter's around, jelly doesn't have to remind you it exists. Peanut butter does all the work for jelly, right? We used this idea a couple of years ago uh, at Stanford University to get undergraduates to eat more fruits and vegetables. They mean to eat more fruits and vegetables. They say they should eat more fruits and vegetables, yet they don't do it. And so we did a simple experiment to try to change behavior. We gave some people one slogan, live the healthy way, eat five fruits and veggies a day, and others a different slogan, each and every dining hall tray needs five fruits and veggies a day. We had them memorize the slogan and think about it a variety of times, and then we looked at whether hearing that slogan changed their behavior. Now, people loved the first slogan. They thought it was really clever, very likely to work, and the second one, not so much. They read it. They thought it was interesting. They said, you know, this one's not really going to change my behavior. It's a little bit clunky. It's not as effective. We didn't just ask them what they thought they would do. We measured what they actually did. We found something quite surprising. First slogan sounded great. People loved hearing it, thought it was really effective, didn't change behavior. Second slogan didn't sound so good. People didn't like it as much. But after hearing it, they ate 25% more, percent more fruits and vegetables. Why? Because it used a trigger in their environment to remind them of the desired behavior. Students, when they went to dinner, picked up a tray and put their dinner on the tray. So just to wrap up, We'll talk very briefly about some of the drivers uh, of word of mouth. Six key factors that cause people to talk and cause them to share. Social currency is all about how we look to others and how making people look good by sharing our message can encourage them to bring us along for the ride. Triggers, top of mind, tip of tongue. Emotion, when we care, we share. The more emotionally connected we are to something, the more we pass it on. But not all positive emotions increase sharing and not all negative decrease them. Public, easy to see, easy to imitate. Practical values, all about useful information. And last but not least is stories. When people put their kids to bed at night, nobody tells bedtime facts. They tell bedtime stories. Stories are the currency of communication. Designing great stories can carry information along for the ride.